Every day we hoistle in at Pilots and Pick Tots Podcast. Welcome to the Pilots and Batard Podcast. This is the podcast with nothing much to do about aircrafts and potentially everything to do with first episodes of a filmic series. Uh, disclaimer, petard is a word, a real word, and petards are bombs. Look it up, read your Shakespeare, and avoid those pesky petards. We will be tackling mostly new series each Monday with the occasional throwback pilot. All of our listeners are invited to follow our blog and participate in our pre-recording discussions where you can be the podcast you want to hear in the world. Our podcast will be broken into four parts, with the first part being mostly spoiler-free, Mo. And part two, <laughs> we are going to dive deeper into the pilot, and Mo is going to be able to spoil whatever she wants. Part three, we, we are going to wander outside of the pilot to any dangling threads of interest, typically themes in the, in the pilot episode. And part four is our fun part. Today, we will have Mo challenging Drew for that number one contender spot, Jacob Williams of the Punisher Body Count, we are coming for you. We're coming for you. Get out the body bag! If you would like to know any more information about our podcast, go to our website. Uh, This is Drew. I'm the pragmatic cyclops of this podcast. And I'm Jimbo, the anti-millennial, non-conforming, existentialist, pilot, critic, and Kenny of the podcast. And I'm the motherfucking magical Miss Mo, master of pilots, nobos, and spoilers. And we would like to thank, one more time, snacks for this ad free listening if you're especially a judge or know a judge get that judge a snack and one more thing fuck you crooked media fuck you for your crooked ads if you would like to contact us to either sponsor a show or slander your rival we are available for money we're glad to do those things so uh what are we watching today guys today we will cast judgment and determine if the deaf dramedy this close will be hoisted or not hoisted that is the question it almost sounded like you said death. Death? Like death as in T-H at the end. Death. Oh, I thought I think I said death, but they'll, they'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. I was like, no one died. Disclaimer, during the show, we may not have used all the best terminology when referring to deaf people and hard of hearing people and deafened people. For the record, for anyone that would like to use the correct term to offend the least amount of people... The correct term for a person that has never been able to hear is the word deaf, and they prefer to be called deaf. People that lose their hearing later on are called deafened. People that lose either mild or severe hearing prefer the term hard of hearing. Hearing impaired is the term that we should no longer use. Fortunately, we referred to hearing impaired people several times in this episode. Please forgive us and use the correct term for now on, which would be deaf people, deafened people, and hard of hearing. Thank you. Enjoy the show. So we're going to jump into the first part of the show, and we will examine our backgrounds. I came across this looking for new pilots to tackle. And then just a little background on the show. These creators, Shoshana Stern and Josh Feldman, they are both deaf actors, creators. They uh, created the show. They wrote the show. They they produced the show. They also created the show out of their own pocket as a YouTube pilot before it was picked up as a web series by Sundance. My background is that Jimbo threw this out there and I had never heard of it. Uh, Hoistlers, we are now going to jump into our two-sentence summary. So, two best friends, Kate and Michael, meet in Seattle to publicize a new book. Uh, what will happen when Michael finds out that Kate hid her engagement from him? Stay tuned to find out if you should give a steaming pile of crap. Part one. This is part one, spoiler-free, highs, lows, evaluation of the quality of the pilot. And Mo, why don't you start us off? Like, high point, low point in between, what do you got? So I enjoyed having a story told by people dealing with being hearing impaired or deaf. I think a lot of the points were really clever and a lot of the circumstances and situations that they presented themselves in were original and exciting. And I never really thought about, it's really hard for me not to spoil. Hey, part two, you get to spoil all you want. Hold it in, Mo. Hold it in. I think I know where Mo is going with this. And, and, and Mo, if I can jump in. <laughs> I think there's a big problem with with media where they usually they usually have people with disabilities or deaf people and and they kind of more like not a very good light I guess kind of like, like helpless kind of like right? yeah like helpless or like victimize them a bit 
Well, I would say it's not nuanced. Like, they have very little depth as characters beyond their disability. And I would say, Mo, that I think the reason that there's so many novel and interesting jokes and perspectives in this show is because this is a show that kind of both acknowledges the identity of their disability while also deep diving into, like, how it affects their lives in, like, funny and humorous ways and insightful ways. So I would say that to, like, a deaf person, like, a bunch of the jokes on this show like they're probably funny they're probably mega relatable but i think the reason they seem novel or original to us is because jimbo you're right media doesn't portray people with disabilities as anything but those disabilities first and any characterization afterwards as like a side product or a side idea what do you think about that yeah i agree and these i mean these two main characters hoisters if you haven't figured it out the two main characters are deaf this is going to sound like a really ignorant white guy thing to say but i've never had any deaf friends these people are very much like our friends and family we all have I mean they're funny they're telling jokes and to see them having like real conversations is very unique on the big screen or like on the small screen on you know like on any screen totally and to add to that I really found it exciting to see these conversations of conflict and humor at the same time without the ability to yell like which 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 is what we would do but I just thought it was interesting to watch those dynamics of of conflict through sign language and through emotion in that way. And so that made the acting even more on point because you had to kind of convey that. And like another high point for sure is that this show is tackling a lot of big themes besides just besides just having issues related to to deaf people there. They have issues related to all sorts of, of people. And there's some huge themes going on relationships and loss and belonging and representation you know beyond um just being deaf but sexuality as well um this is a deeply sexual show um on a few different fronts and i think that was a high point you know like um they didn't pull punches and i mean they cut away but i mean there's there's ways to show a sex scene where people will infer that you know sex is occurring and they went beyond that and it was it was good. It was good for the show. It wasn't for shock value. It was for storytelling purposes. A lot of like intersectionality with the characters. For me, the biggest high point of this show was the deep and complex characters. I'm in my 30s and now I just want to watch like superhero movies and movies that make me feel good. But like in my 20s, like I was all about watching those like morally dense movies where like the main characters all suck and everyone's miserable and things are terrible and like i don't want to watch those movies anymore (laughs) but like this show kind of reminded me of that you know like these people have issues and they're getting through them but it's kind of messy so i liked how um complex the characters are and like their interactions between the two main characters like deepened um how much i wanted to know about the care about the whole show as well as the characters themselves yeah, I think one another high point, so obviously I don't even think we've even came close to a low point yet, but another high point has to be like the intrigue. From the very beginning of the show, there's, it's not like a mystery, but there's definitely information that they're not giving us yet, and I think as a viewer, you really want that information, so the intrigue is there the whole pilot. That's That's a good point. They keep you invested in the characters really quickly right off the bat with very little, you know, cheap tricks to keep you excited or intrigued. Like, Netflix loves to do that. Netflix loves to do that shit. Yeah, and this is not a Netflix (laughs) show. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, free trial. The way that they tell the story is your right mode, not through, like, shock value like Netflix and not through cliffhangers like Netflix. But I think that there's a motif with the ring. You know, it comes back again and again and again. And each time they come back to it, um, you get a little bit more of the story. I almost think of it like an old sweater where it's really satisfying to pull the thread. You know, the more you pull it, you know, the, the more you want to pull it. And so I I would say that, like, this show is intriguing in all the best ways because there's not – it's all human drama. There's no murder, you know. I'm sorry about spoilers. There's no murder in this show. <laughs> Part two, bro. Um, there's no island. There's no island with, like, a, a crash plane. Like, they're just making it happen with compelling human drama. That's definitely a high point. And then – and I think the high point that Mo wanted to bring up is – and and we kind of touched on it as well, but there is a, a decent amount of humor in this in this show. It's not a it's not necessarily a comedy. I mean, I called it a dramedy, but there's definitely some really funny parts about it. And I think one of the scenes that Mo really wants to talk about is a, just a hilarious scene. I love it. It is so quick. It was like two seconds, but I loved it. 
there's more laughs than we're necessarily giving the show credit for. Like I did find this I show. I said to it was be... really funny. I think that's giving credit. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I would say it's more on the side of a comedy than really? a drama. Maybe it's a dark comedy. I was gonna say maybe it is a dark comedy. The lighting lends itself to a dark comedy. Like the aesthetic and the cinematography looks like dark comedy. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. All right. How how about a low point? Just just for just for talking. Well, we are in the generation of Netflix, and so I would have loved a cliffhanger. You wanted a cliffhanger? That's your low point? There wasn't a cliffhanger? <laughs> as much as we praised it for being original and telling a story, without those things, it would have been more fun. Yeah, it could have functioned <laughs> as a short film. Like, I, I see, I'm very interested to go on YouTube and find that original pilot, because I assume they, like, reshot it. They definitely reshot it. They shot, I think they shot the whole original in someone's apartment in L.A., Really? That's cool. I want to watch that now. I know. Wow. Unfortunately, I did not find out about that in time to watch it before recording. Put it in the petardar. The first episode could function as a short Definitely. film, which is a plus and a minus. As in, like, if you walked away after the pilot, you would be enriched, but you wouldn't necessarily have to watch the next episode. Although I did. <laughs> I would not call that a low point, but I think I can build on on like what you guys were talking about. There's really no action in this pilot at all. And I think for some viewers that that's going to be a low point for them it could be i mean i could see someone saying this is a boring show and i wouldn't necessarily argue against them i think for my taste like i'm okay with with a boring plot if it if the characters are really well developed like these characters were this show kind of reminded me a little bit of like a miniature three-act play you know like that's kind of where i felt like the stakes were like in the minutia of like human existence You know, so I mean, I think that just because there's no action doesn't mean there aren't stakes. And I think the show still had stakes, even if it didn't have action. But I mean, if someone were to say it's boring, I would say... You would argue against them? I could acknowledge there's a lack of action, but I would still say that... Change occurs. Okay. I will throw out one more low point, just just for our listeners. You do have to read subtitles, and I know that that could be a potential low point for some. (laughs) <laughs> i'll say this though um i had to rewind the crown a bunch and like i couldn't play with my phone during the crown i didn't really want to play with my phone during the show so maybe i get point. that like low points can be high and high points can be low but i found the show to be um worthwhile in terms of keeping like my fingers free and my eyes on the sc- like one screen instead of two. foreshadowing okay, okay. <laughs> for our show I think it's time to move on, and we are going to go move into our MVPs. And for any new listeners, this is the most valuable part of the pilot. So it could be anything on screen, off screen. This is where Mo had a little struggle, a little struggle party. I know. Talking about spoilers, talking about shows, but I'll just say this. Um, the way that um, this show inserts humor, humanity, and just a really nice demonstration of like the intersection of you know, how being deaf like affects you is great on a couple airplane scenes. So there's just a couple scenes that involve an airplane and an airport in the show. And all of them are insightful and have humor and have like a real depth of emotion. Like I feel like this show was grounded in those scenes. And I think they're a huge strength of the pilot. I agree. And I think those scenes are very real. And I think that a deaf audience is going to super appreciate those scenes and i think i'm going to come back to at least one of them in our dangling threads so mo and i in our notes we we both had our mvp as kate and i could and i could maybe even i mean i think it it's kate the character but i think it also needs to be the actress as well she was my most valuable part of the pilot so you know they they can share it maybe between the character and the actress because i probably pulled from a true situation there's a few events in the show that that I've verified that are from the character or are from the creators' real lives. Yeah, Kate was a standout. When we're talking about the humor, she she is the one that's really hitting a lot of a lot of the humor. She was very funny. She had a lot of nuanced um, character moments. Um, and then the thing too was she kind of had to be like, I mean, I know there's a gay character, so I mean, I don't mean straight man in terms of sexuality, but like she kind of had to be like the more grounded character. So that, you know, her best friend could, like, kind of have some drama and have some adventure and, like, have some conflict. Whereas, like, her conflict had to be more restrained. And even with that, she was still very humorous, very emotional. And, like, she wasn't, like, the stick in the mud, even though she kind of had to be the, like, let's not miss our flight person. You know, it's very cool. It was an awesome performance. 
She was the Cyclops of that show. No, dude, do not say that about her, man. She was not a Cyclops. She was. Cyclops has never made me laugh in 20 years of (laughs) X-Men fandom. You're reading the wrong comics. Okay. Mo's just waiting for part two, man. She's just biting her lip over there. I know. There. We got to make the we gotta make part two like the Mo Memorial. <laughs> all right, Hoisters. And now, the moment before the moment we've all been waiting for. For anyone that hasn't seen this pilot yet, you can get a seven-day free trial to Sundance. And so, for we all have the seven-day trial. Are we going to watch the rest of this series before our seven days run out? Are we going to go into episode two or three and try and finish this sucker off? Yeah, I watched the second episode and it was so fucking intense. Really? Ooh. It was good. It was cool. Yeah, I definitely want to watch it. The the first one is such a bottle episode, you know, like um the second one really opens up with a bunch of new characters, situations and things that like it's very easy to um for me at least differentiate between the pilot and the second episode because the pilot is so contained. I'm probably not going to watch it unless Miss Miss Nomalous or Mrs. Nomalous jumps on board and we finish it in the next seven days, I'm I'm probably not going to watch it. Although, you need a partner in this. You can't do it alone. I can. <laughs> if I was single and I only watched TV by myself, I don't think I would watch the second episode. So, Hoistlers, the moment that you've been waiting for, we're going to answer the question, to hoist or not to hoist. Remember, if a show is not very good, it gets hoisted on its own petard. <laughs> explode but if it's good it's a not hoist so mo i feel like i know where you're at where are you at i'm not hoisting this one i like the originality and the characters and the writing and yes i'm all for it not hoist yeah i'm not hoisting and hearing jimbo talk about the background of the people making the show and then selling it that way like that makes me like it even more so this is a big not hoist yeah on on my first viewing i was a little on the fence, leaning towards not hoist, but this show, we had a great conversation and we didn't really find any real low points. This is a very solid not hoist. The, when I was watching this, like, you know, five or ten minutes into something, you can tell if something is like special. And I was like, I kind of found myself settling and like getting into the mind space of like, I want to enjoy this, you know? And so I feel like I did. You know, I kind of like sometimes I'll watch for this, for us recording in mind that oh i'm gonna call that out or that's a crab man or something but this one i was just like i'm i'm gonna enjoy this this was like good and original like i was just like this is like nothing that i'm watching right now it's like refreshing by unanimous decision the pilot episode of this close is not hoisted and so now hoisters part two we're gonna spoil everything in this section part two is where we are going to jump into our filmic analysis and interpretation this is going to be hella spoilers so if you haven't watched it and you care you need to stop listening go watch it and come back yeah pause pause and go watch it option that's the way you could listen to our podcast from now on you could like listen to the first 20 minutes and then pause it hey our first section of part two is going to be our crab man award hey girl hey crab man and Mo, can you explain for any new listeners, what is a Crab Man? Totally. I love the Crab Man Award. It goes to the person who, person or event, but not non-humans, if I believe. What? No, my gosh. Unless they're bureaucrats. <laughs> right. Intellectual being. Intellectual beings with spines. With spines. <laughs> no, actually, no, that's not true, because the dog. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting distracted. All right, Drew, can you explain the Crab Man for any new (laughs) listeners? (laughs) Yes, I can, as long as you don't edit any of that out. (laughs) I did a good job. You did. It was fine. Uh, So quickly, the the Crab Man Award, or or Crab X, (laughs) or um, Crab Person Award, (laughs) is any sentient creature, not dinosaur or robot, um, who has a very small role in the pilot, but they tend to give a lot to the story or to the storytelling. Traditionally, a Crab Man, Crab X Award is not a featured uh, player or a recurring cast member. We ha- It looks like we we're going to have a, a little bit of a crab discussion here. I'm, I have to give it to the first airline's attendant. And since we can talk about spoilers finally, they are taking a flight to Seattle to publicize Michael's new book. I guess they're trying to do pre- pre-boarding and they tell the woman they're deaf. So for one, she starts yelling at them. Which is like strike one. That's that's, that's <laughs> not going to help a deaf person hear you yelling. 
<laughs> that, that does help a person who doesn't speak your language understand yes, you, though. Yes, That's definitely. true. Loud so and that's slow. Strike one against my 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 crab woman. Strike two. She orders in wheelchairs. Like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and the best part is they just take it. They just sit down in their wheelchairs and they're yeah. just having a good time. So, dude, <laughs> she's a super crab man, man. She 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 brings a ton of humor, and I guarantee deaf people are dealing with stupidity like this all the time because Americans are not aware of other people different than themselves. <laughs> They just don't know how to interact with people that are different than them because they've never have. Like you said, Jimbo, like you've never had a deaf friend. I bet you've probably never in- engaged with a deaf person for more than five minutes if you have. Or yeah, I, I haven't. Or, I mean, look, I have it. Yeah, look, luckily for me, I did take a course in college, a disabilities class in, this, in the context of, of education. So I did hear someone that was teaching about all these different issues. And that was the first time that I really started thinking about that. that I mean, that's when I stopped u- using the word retard. For me, like, I am aware of these issues. But before that class, I was completely oblivious. Like, I would have I, I would have been just as ignorant and misinformed as, as your average airline attendant. <laughs> Although they have to be better trained. I get, if anyone is going to run into a deaf person, it's going to be like a, an airline attendant. Right. They see people all day. I would say my Crabman Award um, goes to a, again, a small performance, but um, um, Michael uh, is doing a book talk in Seattle and a deaf person stands up in the audience and asks him a question. And Michael is having like a mega shitty time and he's got some destructive behavior going on and he might be drunk. And so he answers the question like, Real honestly, and just the reaction by the actor and the way that he asked the question and reacts to it, it's really, really compelling because at that point, um, we, the audience, if we're not used to a translator, filling that gap between um, the sign language and um, the expression being expressed, you know, you kind of get used to it. Whereas like this actor, I think did such a good job expressing how he felt through the sign language and it was enhanced by the translator. So I just thought that was a really good um, performance. And like the last thing he says is like, whoa, honest. And like his face is just so expressive of that idea. And I was just like, I, I, that was like one of the first parts of the show where like, I didn't necessarily internalize the sign language and the translator. It was more just like, I got that that was that person's sentiment. And I think the longer the show went on, the more natural that became. That it wasn't like, oh, I'm reading subtitles. This is sign language. It's like, no, like these people are expressing themselves and I'm getting more used to like this form of expression. Yeah, and that and that book signing scene does a lot for for Michael and the show. And and you have you have the the bookstore owners just kind of like jer- jerking him off because he's so in love with them and he writes a gay character. So like he's being he's being rewarded for writing a gay character and then he's being condemned for like not making that character deaf. And yeah, he's just so honest. The thing he says is that he wouldn't think it would sell. And that's that's real, dude. That's real fucking meta when you think about, like, Jimbo, what you said about these guys, like, selling their own pilot. What about you, Mo? What do you think about that? I I like that part because it brought to light the reality that Michael's facing, which is his intersectional identity of, yes, I'm a gay man, and there's not enough gay protagonists, and I wrote this great story. But then also having to cope with the fact that a lot of deaf people probably looked up to him as an author and there's probably not a lot of those around and so the blunt honesty was a little bit cringeworthy to me only because he was already kind of acting out and not being I mean he was he didn't want to be there and well I don't want to talk about the ring yet well we can get into that later but (laughs) he had seen the ring that's why he was self-destructive yeah so it was just too like he was too much of a loose cannon for me so that yeah his response was honest and blunt but i did i just wish he could have been a little bit more respectful to people that were there to see him yeah he's doing his writing career absolutely no good like what the fuck are you doing (laughs) there's no tact that's what it is like you can be honest but if you have tact you don't have to do what he did you know background this was the this this pilot series that uh, that they did together was the first time he ever wrote a deaf character so like that scene is like very real like all of his writing through his whole career was always whatever you call non-deaf people. This was his first time tackling a deaf a deaf character in his writing. We're saying disabled a bunch. Should we be saying differently abled? Is that like what you refer to a person who has hearing loss or is deaf? So deaf people do not consider themselves disabled. So I think you call them deaf people. 
that will that's what we'll do moving forward. Yeah, I said hearing impaired earlier. Is that okay? That's probably fine. I remember learning that deaf people like they like they like own like they own being deaf, and I I feel like their community in general prefers that term. Okay. Well, you know we're trying, and you know we will get better, which is all we can ask of people. And this is why shows like this are so important. Mo, why don't you talk about your crab person? You put a scene. So Jimbo yells at me when I pick dinosaurs yeah, dude, and robots, no but you scene, picked a there's scene. There's no crab Mo. scenes, man. Oh. Pick a person. Then I'm gonna say my crab award goes to all those crying babies on the flight and the sneezing guy. <laughs> the who? The the airline passengers. Because I thought that scene was so crab great. Crab man, singular, Mo. Singular. Mo Mo has a crab tracking <laughs> shot because she just liked that one tracking shot of just the horribleness that is air travel. Yes, and then so this is what I wanted to talk about earlier. Okay, let's let's talk okay. about that next Fine. as a why as a scene. There's some analysis we're gonna do. Got it. So Mo, I think that's a valid one. I think the the airline passengers were horrible and made that scene. Pick one of them. Pick the worst one. The sneezing guy to me. I per, I would take a crying baby over a sneezing person any day. That's true. They recycle the air. It's disgusting up there. <laughs> So I pick him because he was so gross and the way he was sneezing directly into his hands and everything about it just pissed me off and was gross. But then they were sound asleep and it was funny. That's pretty good. That that guy is the worst. <laughs> we all know that guy. All right. Is anyone moving over from their nomination to someone else's? I like the airline attendant. I was about to say, um, I thought you meant the later airline attendant with the more drama filled scene. No, dude, that guy sucks. Well, I think he brought a lot to the. He does. I mean, he does do a lot, but he's not. He he's not a crab man. He doesn't deserve it. He's a foil character. I give it to the airline attendant as long as respect is given to that dude yeah, in the hell, audience. Hell that was respect. a good performance. Yeah, it was. Then that's fine. The airline attendant really does a good job setting the tone of the show, and also like there's a great like level of like the office style, like Jim staring at the camera humor right off the bat, which is one of my favorite types of humor. All right, so by unanimous decision, the first airline attendant that calls the wheelchairs going home with the crab man. All right, so now, Hoistlers, we're going to jump into a literary analysis of the pilot, the plot, and the characters. So these are story notes, spoiler, full of spoilers, and anything that might remind you of, like, you know, something else outside the story or maybe even a motif. All right, let's give Mo what she wants. Talk about it, Mo. Get in there, Mo. Talk about talk about those scenes. Get in there, Mo. Uh, which one? Where do we start? Your scene. Those the airline, airline scenes you like. The airport. Every, the airport. Okay. So the, the, the scene airplane. I was talking about in my crab man was they panned the airplane and there's like two babies crying and yelling. And then they panned to the noise. gross guy who was so my crab man. So noisy. Just a rowdy ass fucking flight, which we all know we've been on. I have, I've had a child on that flight. I've contributed to that <laughs> shit. I'll be contributing to that in November. You know what? And that's why Fuck I, you, don't baby shame I people. I can tolerate you babies. That's why I gave it to the the sneezer. Cuz the babies it's like fuck you. You're bringing me on this tiny plane and I don't know where I am. But anyway, I bet Mozambique and babies wouldn't wouldn't cry on the, on a flight though. They would literally be like helping serve drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Creances would be like going up and down the aisle. <laughs> Their eyes would be like, like all bug eyed and they'd just be looking around just so curious, like what the hell kind of shoppa is this? <laughs> um, wait, what's the other girl the girl's character name? I'm sorry, I forgot. Michael and Kate, that's right. Duh. She was MVP. God. It pants to them and they're just dead asleep, just sleeping so blissfully. And I appreciated that scene because it gave like a, a silver lining to being deaf. I think that again, like we mentioned before, a lot of the times it's portrayed as being um, like as they're portrayed as being helpless or we should have pity on them or it's some tragic story of how they became deaf or oh, there's so many things but I just like that there it was like a humorous way to be like huh fuck you all you people have to listen to this like we don't yes <laughs> and that that's is so a time funny. you probably wish you were deaf <laughs> well I think one thing we talk about this show is kind of if not the politics of humor then at least the intent of humor and being hearing impaired is not the butt of that joke. Like the butt of that joke is that planes suck, you know? And so like, that's the way to tell a joke about a deaf person on a plane by not making them the butt of the joke. Whereas in coarser times, and even I'm sure still somewhere like 
differently able people or even deaf people or hearing impaired people might be the butt of a joke in a crass situation. Whereas like it reveals the depth of this show and their influence on it, that that's a really funny joke. And it is at the expense of like the right people. Yeah. I even, I even saw that, that the characters and like, I think the other deaf, deaf viewers will appreciate this as well is it almost seems like they kind of allow themselves to play dumb a little bit just to kind of get out of, of stuff. You know, like when the security guard is trying to tell him about checking his pockets, deaf people can read lips and his sentence was fairly simple. He, he, I think he understood just fine, but he was like, sorry, man, I'm deaf. It just as like, <laughs> like, kind of like a, like, fuck you, man. Like I, like, I don't care to, to pay attention to you. And so like, I, <laughs> I thought there was the a, co- yeah. And so like, I, I think that's another that. time where like they're empowering deaf people and it's, you don't have to pity them. Like, I'm not sure like what I'm trying to say now, but like they like go through the world and they're empowered and they live great lives and they can fuck with the security guard at, in, at the <laughs> security line for NSA. Yeah. It's, it's the depth that we spoke of, you know, it's like, give these characters latitude, give them high moments, give them low moments, like let them do something small and petty. Let them do something kind, you know, like don't just make them one dimensional characters. And they did a great job incorporating, you know, being deaf as like part of their existence and like opening this small window into like what that's like, even though it was only 23 minutes long. Did you notice in the very opening, Kate has, has hearing aid in. So I, I'm pretty sure Kate can hear at least to some degree. And she definitely yeah. does speak. She, she can. I watched yeah, the second okay, episode. Okay. Um, she's still very much hearing yes. impaired, but the show does an awesome job. Um, not visualizing it, but, um, audioizing it that's not a word but you know what i mean like they like the sound engineering of it yes the sound engineering is brilliant yeah and like there is a distinction between those two characters as well that's what i wanted to mention about kate anyone else have anything to add about that Uh, otherwise i think michael's the one that that really deserves to be talked about um i'll say this real quick as a literary motif i wasn't able i talked about it briefly with the ring that keeps coming back I think that it's very, very cool. I think that like when stories have like a little running, um, you know, something that they come back to or like something where like you pull the thread or just like the more you learn about the characters and learn about the story, like the more that you're intrigued and pulled in. And I thought the ring was just great. Like every time that the ring comes out or the ring is brought up or the ring is seen, like we learn more about each character and it just deepens their relationship and deepens like our relationship with the characters too. Like there's just that, I call it like the gun above the mantle because, you know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle said, if there is a play and there's a gun above the mantle, above the fireplace in the first act, check off. Okay. Well, it must be fired um, by the third act. Is that Chekhov's gun? Yes. Oh, well I heard, well, I guess they don't call it Arthur Conan Doyle's, but I thought that was cool. <laughs> you know, like the ring is important in the first scene and it pays off and not in a stupid, obvious way, like in a heartfelt, emotional way. Yeah. yeah. Don't show the dumbass ring if the dumbass ring isn't going to be like really important later. And I guess for our listeners, we should mention that. Did we mention what the whole thread is with the ring? We could. I mean, if we think it's interesting, then we can talk about it. Otherwise, they, they can listen, figure it out. That's true. Yeah, they can go watch the Stay show. Tuned. You can watch the show, too. It's good. It's free if you have an internet provider. Yeah, just make sure to cancel within seven days or else you will be charged. Yes, because they will, they will charge you like $6 a month, which is not that big of a loss. There's probably some other stuff worth watching on, on Sunday. I know. Now I'm, like, now I'm like intrigued by this Sundance affair. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I, I think we should talk about Michael for at least a little bit. So he's, he's recently ended an engagement. So that's, that's one of the reasons why the ring is a big deal, because he broke off his engagement. We don't really know why. We know he participates in risky behavior. He's drinking early. He gets super drunk. He gets kicked off the plane because he's too wasted. And he has unprotected sex with a rando. And so, I mean, and he's kind of being an asshole to his fans. So, I mean, there's a lot going on with, with, with Michael. What do you guys think? Well, I think just not to talk about the ring, like, beat the, to death, but it does say a lot about him as a character. If his own best friend couldn't tell him she was engaged because he was so sensitive about his recent breakup. Like, obviously, anyone would be vulnerable in that stage, but I don't know. Like, how unstable are you as a person if you can't look past your own problems and be happy for your friend is engaged? But maybe there's more to the story because she did. I found it interesting when she said that she knew her fiance wasn't perfect. And he kind of just said nobody is. And that could definitely be a hint towards something as well. Right. Like, maybe it wasn't just that she was engaged, but she was engaged to him. But that's an important distinction. 
for people that have a best friend and you can't tell your best friend about the big, maybe one of the most important moments in your life, like the, that's saying a ton about your best friend. Anyway, back to Michael. I thought he was just losing his shit. Well, I think this show did a good job portraying destructive behavior as destructive in a very different like set of context or set of circumstances for a different audience. Like those are all like cool things. So I mean, like, yeah, like if it, like if we were watching Entourage or something. Yeah, if we were watching Entourage, <laughs> like this would all be like mega cool shit, man. But like, I think it's a testament to the show that like we as the audience are uncomfortable. Oh, those aren't good things. You know, like the thing is, all the signs are there too. You know, from the beginning, and then like. Again, like as the show progresses, like we just understand more and more. And the thing is, dude, she's not wrong. She probably wanted to find the right time to tell him. Yeah, for sure. Because when he found the ring, he did spiral even further. Yeah, ruined the whole weekend. I mean, assuming that that was a weekend. I mean, I bet you that's a funny story later. I mean, I hope he was texting his friend when he was out. I don't think he was. I don't think he was responding. Yeah, that's crazy. I would be calling the police if my friend was gone all night like that. I would be so scared and not just be so casual and see you on the plane just to get kicked off. <laughs> I think we all have at least one friend that we would not have called the police if they just didn't answer us all night. <laughs> it's like you just need I'm it. <laughs> like running through a Rolex of people. I'm like, yeah, no, I'd leave that person. Just see them tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I feel like I'm that friend, actually, to some people. <laughs> Well, that's the awkward thing, too, about adult friendship, you know, like you're nobody's parent, you know, and if they choose to make those decisions, like it's hard, it's limiting. What do you say to like another person who's like above the age of 29? Right. Like that's that's either a mega real conversation where like you don't come back from it or you let people like make their own mistakes and you just fucking freak out because it is worrisome. Dude, if you're not in the hospital, you owe me big time. I got your bags, piece of shit. <laughs> Literally. Bring me a yeah. fucking Starbucks. Bring me a latte stat. I would have been so pissed. With like a Benjamin Franklin wrapped around it. <laughs> Literally. I'm not a, I not will, a you damn will be billed chauffeur. For this. Yeah. <laughs> what was that lady on the plane's problem? Why, why like, it's bullshit yeah, that, that she's was like, weird. that she's like, deaf he's, guy is yeah. extremely drunk. Like, yeah. if no one can tell, I, I like, and they're not sitting her. in a fucking exit aisle, like... What's your problem, lady? Kate Kate mentions that it, it she said some something along the lines like it smells like you were dipped in a vat of vodka. So I mean I think it's safe to say that homeboy's like super wasted. Great. Let him pass out. I mean he's not following directions. It's not that hard. I mean I think he got the point that he was supposed to put his belt on. I, I think it's fair to say that he's a bit belligerent. Now it definitely escalates way too far, and that's what I want to talk about in part three. So unless we have anything else to add on Michael's character, I think I'm good. And I think we touched on everything in the notes. I'll say um, just one more thing. Um, that was a mega compelling scene um, when he was getting dragged off the plane. Like, that was scary, you know? And, like, to me, that's when things – I mean, the show was – I don't want to say better than I expected because I don't – I didn't know what to expect. But the show kind of jumped up. Like, it jumped up another level in that scene too because, like, I was just like, damn, this is, like, real tense and real scary. Sorry. Okay, Hoisters, we are going to come back to this because I think this is a great dangling thread, and I did do some research on it. So now, Hoistlers – we're moving on to the Put It Anywhere Guys quest for the best. <laughs> right. oh, Mo, what do we do on the quest for the best? We rank the pilot, and I just think it's stupid. Hoisters, briefly, we have a running list of all the pilots. Go to the website, check out the list. We are going to place the pilot for this close into that list for our quest of the best and worst pilots ever. At the top, we have End of the Fucking World, best pilot ever. At the bottom, we have Buffy, worst pilot ever. And this is a definitive list. This will include all pilots of all time by the time our project is over. Jimbo, you know, I, I feel like you've come around a little bit in the conversation on the show. In the show notes, you have it a bit lower. Yeah, I had it near Kimmy. Yeah, well, sell me on it. Where, what do you think? Because, I, I mean, I think we know where Mo wants it. Put it anywhere. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Mo. <laughs> This show's mega original to me, and it does a lot of things that we want a pilot to do. I think we're going to come back to this list because there's there's a chunk of, of shows that I think just got sandwiched in the wrong spot. Yeah, and I know what you're talking about. What do you think about The Crown? Uh, I think the show's better than The Crown because The Crown was annoying because I, like, so? I had to like actively pay attention to The Crown when I wanted to play with my phone, whereas this show like made me forget about my phone. So do you think it's better than Cheers then? 
I'm looking in the neighborhood of Rick and Morty and Wonder Years. Okay. Like, I like the backstory of this show. I like the representation of this show. I like the characters in this show and how compelling they are. I like the humor. And I watched the next episode. So, I mean, I feel like it's successful. Mo, you got any comments? I think it's better than... Where's Boy Meets World? Boy Meets World is way down there. It's it's in number 23. Would I rather watch episode two of Wonder Years or this close i would rather watch episode number two of this close yeah i was gonna say i did watch both i watched episode two of the wonder years and i watched episode two of this close now i did watch episode two of killing eve so i think it definitely has to go below killing eve I'm fine with that i did watch the second episode of cobra kai but that was more of a mrs anomalous uh, one to watch too much it. of a range man i this goes above punisher for me what do, what do you think mo wonder years Above or below Wonder Years? I think it should go below. Okay. Above or below Rick and Morty? I think above Rick and Morty. Let's do it. Then that's where it is. All right. We have a new number 13. That's our new number 13. Love it. Great. I agree. Totally. (laughs) I was ready. I I got in there. I was ready to throw some elbows for this close. I was like, come on. I mean, I guess it's good for our listeners to have a ranking. I get that. But I'm just the most indecisive person in the world, which is probably why I will never get a tattoo. Good. That's that's one good thing. But this but but we will push you to be more decisive each week okay. in the quest for the best and worst palettes ever. And Mo, <laughs> three years from now, when you get your quest for the best tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> if like, I get a tattoo, our job will be, be done. Q for B, for sure. <laughs> we'll just be like P and P colon Q for B. Yeah. Put it anywhere. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. There you go. And so now, okay. part three. And so for any new hoisters out there, this is where we are going to wander outside of the pilot episode, and we're going to focus on probably mostly themes or anything that we found interesting in the show that we haven't talked about yet. And so the big one that we kind of almost started talking about was that scene where Michael gets dragged off the airplane by police. I did some research into this, but first, if you guys want to just throw in any comments, and then then I can kind of share the stuff that that I found out. There's a thing I like to talk about, perceived power versus, like, actual power, and I think that, like, Game of Thrones is a really good show that, like, demonstrates this idea, you know? Like, there's this idea that um, institutional power gives you these things, Whereas, like, pragmatic power, the power of the moment, is a lot scarier and visceral. And that's what this scene demonstrates, you know? Like, yes, like, Michael has rights, and Michael, you know, has fail-safes that, like, should protect him, and they don't. Because in that moment, like, if you fuck around on an airplane, or if you fuck with an air marshal, like, it's gonna go sour, and it's gonna go bad fast. That was real. And, like, the perceived institutional power that Michael has didn't matter in that moment. And, I mean, that's one of the, like, the scariest things that, like, we as a society have to contemplate, you know? Because, like, everything's fine until it's not. And people in power are great until they misuse that power. And we don't know when it'll happen, which is why I think the scene is affecting. Yeah, this this happened to, to Shoshana Stern's brother in real life. He was dragged off of an airplane. They had talked about in in, in an interview that... It's not necessarily against the law to cuff a deaf person and you don't have to legally write something down for them. I think the point is like they're trying to bring awareness to the fact that when you cuff a deaf person's hands, like you're taking away their ability to communicate, especially if you cuff their hands behind their back. Right. You're like actually silencing them. And then there was an incident where a deaf person was was killed because they fell and they like landed on their face because they were trying to communicate. And, and they and they couldn't. There's also a, a couple other incidences as well of deaf people being killed one because they could not hear an officer's command. So there's definitely some an issue that is I would say never brought up about police brutality towards deaf people, and it mainly has to do with awareness. Just that the cops aren't really trained to handle someone that is deaf. One out of three hundred people in America are deaf. One out of eight or nine have some type of hearing impairment. Um, I'll say this. I saw a a statistic, um, you know, we've discussed police brutality on the show before, um, but it was a statistic about how the average officer's training of like arms and weapons um, versus like de-escalation and conflict management. And it is massively disproportionate towards like martial training versus de-escalation. Somewhere in the range of like, I believe the article I saw was like 16 to 1. And I have two things I'm going to add 
to, to the Petardar. So there was an Oklahoma City officer that fatally shot a deaf man. And they had talked about how, how, their, how some of their officers had like four hours of training on how to deal with hearing impaired people or something, or something along those lines. So, I mean, it's like you have your police department and maybe people are getting four hours of training on how to deal with one out of eight to nine Americans. Seems to be a bit of a discrepancy there. And if we were to look at their hours of shooting a weapon, it would probably be a lot more than four hours. I'm glad you did your research, Jimbo, because I think that is a really important point to pull from that scene, aside from just the obvious human rights violation, but the fact that there are real life cases of that happening and that it is you're removing their ability to communicate. Yeah. And this is a scene that a normal writer that wasn't living as a deaf person would have probably never got without having deaf people in the writing room. They probably would have missed this opportunity. Because even the people on the plane probably didn't realize he was deaf. As a, as, as a bystander, like even that woman who t- ratted him out, do you think she even realized he was deaf? Like if you were in the back of the plane and you saw a big commotion, you probably didn't realize the, the violation that was happening. Yeah, and like I thought this scene, because when I first saw it, I definitely thought it was talking about that, that Asian guy that was arrested and kind of beat up by the cops. And that was like within the last year. Remember him? Oh, yeah. Um, it was on United, right? So I thought it was it was like bringing up that issue it wasn't it was actually like based off of an actual deaf person being dragged off on an airplane and this whole this whole you know like this whole issues about about police and maybe security guards in general not knowing how to deal with deaf people and i think it was brought up a few times in the episode to kind of clue viewers in that maybe don't interact with deaf people as much was the fact that they already have one sense removed so removing another one is that much more like frightening and puts the person in a state of panic like when she was describing her proposal and how he blindfolded her and she was like now I have two senses removed and I never even like I never even considered that or thought of that you think you're being romantic (laughs) I know (laughs) and she's like having a panic attack so I thought that was interesting too and that scene brought that out too if one of us three were blindfolded what would we rely on Right, our hearing. Our hearing and our touch. We, we would rely on two things. But to have neither? I have one more to bring up, but Drew, what's yours? This is an interesting one to bring up because I think what really, what I really, really liked about this show, and sometimes I feel this way about like art in general, like movies and things, is like I loved the production story and I loved more and more what I learned about like how much these creators have put into it. So... I want to hear y'all's thoughts on where we are in 2018 with like shows by marginalized persons. Like what is the balance of like representation, like telling stories about marginalized people versus having authentic stories being told. And I think the most recent example of this being like, you know, tricky is when Scarlett Johansson was like cast in that uh, rub and tug movie, which was about the transgender um, person who ran the prostitution ring and people pushed back hard because they were just like, why don't you find a trans person to tell his stories? She keeps getting in trouble for that shit, too. Say what? Scarlett Johansson keeps accepting roles that she shouldn't be accepting. Portrayed an Asian character, and who's obviously, like, not Asian at all. In The Ghost in the Shell, is that, is that the movie? Yeah, she plays a cyborg where, like, the brain of an Asian character is implanted in a blonde woman. Oh. And everyone else is Asian, because it's set in, like, Neo-Tokyo, but... Scarlett Johansson is Scarlett Johansson. Right. Say more about why you think she shouldn't accept these roles. Well, I just think as being a person in a position of privilege and power, you have the choice to be an ally and tell whoever's scouting you that, no, you shouldn't be asking anyone that looks like me or comes from my background to be playing this role. You need to pick someone that is actually trans or Asian or it feels like appropriation. It just feels disrespectful that she wouldn't even think about that. Like, who are her PR people? Who's her agent? Like, why are they even bringing this to her? I have I have a couple arguments may, maybe against, and I don't necessarily know if I disagree with you or agree with you. I haven't, I haven't researched enough to maybe form really strong opinion about it. But what if, what if she didn't do that role? Then that maybe story wouldn't have got as much attention. So I think that's maybe one argument that someone could, could try and throw at you. The other thing is she's, she's an actress. She's going to make movies. So should she only play like a spoiled white girl or is is she doing something by playing these other roles as well that's not fair i mean employment decisions are personal like i i can choose specifically where i want to work 
what's not fair about it? That, you know, you're saying that, like, she doesn't get a chance or, like, that she shouldn't have, like, some say in terms of, like, I I use morality as a choice for my career. You know, like, I have made specific decisions about my career based on my values. So I have not taken the first thing that's come along. You know, like, I have well, made specific choices. You don't know that she has either. And we don't know, but, I mean, implicitly, like, I think those are some bad choices. She doesn't have to take any job. My point is that she's going to take a job, so... Would you rather her play, like, a, an upper-class, like, sexy white girl? Or would you rather her play a more diverse character? I'd rather she not take the opportunity from, like, working trans actors or actresses. Yeah, I think it's different to play someone of a different, like, socioeconomic status of you or okay. even a, of a different, like, play an ugly person or a poor person or a person from a different decade. That's that's a little bit different in Hollywood than, than just taking a a marginalized person's role or a print whatever because like that just seems more out of line to me that seems a way more extreme step in your acting career i know acting you're supposed to be another person and consume another identity and it's all artsy and shit but that's just out of line when there's plenty of trans actors out there let me ask this um 1993 philadelphia comes out you know tom hanks wins an oscar for playing like a gay um, HIV positive man and it's applauded at the time and I bet it's I imagine it's still appreciated I mean that's like that's like Tom Hanks claim to being a real actor before that movie he made silly-ish movies big was fucking awesome I know so, but it's but like an Adam Sandler like big daddy movie yeah shut the fuck up Dude, it like because big is not like an Adam Sandler movie it a, vi- a video recorder turns a guy into a kid come on but it's I mean, emotional. I, or sorry a kid into a guy it's very it emotional is. and it's fantastic okay, but let's okay, move but- on yeah <laughs> but here's the thing. Let me ask this question. It's a um, movie. <laughs> what, like, what do you think is the next frontier? Like, where do you think? Because it seems like, I mean, I'm sure there are more marginalized persons than trans people, but I, I also know that like the suicide rate of trans people is really high, and that like the way that society views them is definitely different. So, is that kind of like maybe the last frontier in terms of if we get trans people in these roles, then we will get to that place because. Um, what I was going to bring up too is um, there's going to be an openly gay um, character in an upcoming Disney live action movie, and people are mad because the portrayal is not by an openly gay actor. I think we've come far enough along that there's plenty of openly gay actors that could be considered for the role. But I mean, Jared Leto won a Best Supporting Actor for. So I don't know. I mean, I, I know there's shifting mores, but I mean. I'm just like it's very interesting to look at like decades past. Maybe it's about maybe it's not so much about the actors. Maybe it's about where society is, you know, because society was definitely in a different place in 1993. And maybe Tom Hanks, who did have some cachet as a famous person, was able to like you know get in there. And, and Denzel Washington too, you know, he added his gravitas and his star power to that movie. I get that because if you want to present something that society might not be yet comfortable with, you want to present it in the most familiar way so maybe having someone yeah that's what i was saying like like if if scarlett johansson's a big name she can bring more probably a lot more attention than the biggest trans actor yeah but also you can bring attention by going to the media and saying i turned down this role because i mean that's not the only way yeah that could be another route there's not a lot of trans roles out there and so if you are a trans actor and you're not hired for a trans role your chances of getting hired are a lot slimmer so we've dangled yeah yes i don't even how did we even start (laughs) talking about marginalized representative people the the trans issue has gained a lot of popularity recently and i wonder i wonder how the trans representation on screen is compared with with the actual representation in in America, I feel like trans people are probably being re- represented pretty decently right now. But I, mm. we have to look that up. Hoisters, if you want, look that up. We'll add it to the. Uh, we'll add a comment, or a separate discussion. Or thread. a separate discussion thread. Yeah. Because I can only think of one show that actually has two. Orange is the New Black, and that oh. Jeffrey Tambor show he's not on anymore on Amazon. Oh right, transparent and Pose, obviously. Yep, there's three. Well, okay. I'm dangled. There's one more thing, Jimbo, but you're the one who edits, so it's up to you whether or not we get in there. Maybe we can just add, this is the last one, and let's make it brief, but the author is very honest about 
writing for money. Like the reason he didn't write a deaf character is because he didn't think it would sell. And we did talk about it and that's very real. And I think any author is going to be dealing with that. And his one answer was like, that's what my editor wanted. And when it comes down to the end of the day, like your editor tells you to do something, they're the ones that are, you know, are influencing whether you're going to be paid or not. Also as an educator, like people want to like take some things away from business or some things away from money. Don't nothing can get taken away from money. You know, everything is about price and everything is basically a business and schools are a business. So, I mean, I definitely see writing and creative efforts as a business as well. And Jimbo, you're right. When the boss tells you to do something like you, you make a choice, you know, like you can make that choice, but one choice leads to like financial security and one leads to not. Yes. And unless you're Stephen King or Scarlett Johansson, like if, if someone was paying me to write a book, right, like right now, where I am in my life right now, I'd pretty much be tap dancing for them. I'd, I'd be whatever, you know, whatever you tell I'll me. I'll say sure, whatever like, you want. <laughs> depending on how much they were paying me. Now, if they were paying me like minimum wage, I'd be like, no, I can go work at McDonald's. But, you know, if, if they're like paying me like real person money and this could get me a potentially a writing career. Yeah, dude. Because then it might, it might like push you into a position where you where can, can then bring up the topics <laughs> and themes that you can, you do want to talk about and that you do feel passionate yeah, about and think are exactly. important. Exactly. Let's go ahead and jump into the Patardar. So listeners, um, the Patardar are recommendations for you based on the pilot viewing experience. I, I got something on my Patardar. Um, I'll put, I mentioned it before, like that this show reminded me of like those uncomfortable dramas that you kind of make yourself watch when you want to feel like you're a smart movie watcher. So I'll put like American Beauty and Traffic on here because those movies are freaking downers and I would never watch them again, especially because Kevin Spacey's a creep. But I remember forcing myself to, like, watch those movies because I guess at the time they did give me some introspection or something like that. But I, passing that, like, 30 or 32 mark, like, I don't I don't want to see those movies anymore. And actually, I'll put Crazy Rich Asians on my petardar because that's where I'm at now. That movie was pleasant as fuck, and it was good. You should go see that, uh, I listeners. I loved it. It was fun and it was pleasant and it did not like, I mean, it was great representation, but like, I love that it didn't like throw me into like a thinking about my life way too much shame spiral. Thanks, crazy rotations. Let's go to the Patardar. So good. It should be in the Patardar until it's like on DVD. <laughs> um, One thing that comes to mind that this show kind of reminded me of is um this series called Easy. It's on Netflix. I don't even know how to describe it. It's kind of each episode is standalone, but also the characters weave into each other in an interesting way. Um, but a lot of the topics more or less are similar, just relationships and a lot of sex and drama. So I'd watch that, and but there's still always humor. All right, so I have I have a a, a couple. Um, Lightning Jack is a western. It's a comedy. I haven't <laughs> seen it in years, but I loved that movie when I was younger. And Cuban Gooding Jr. plays a deaf a deaf boy, I guess. And he becomes, and he becomes like the sidekick to this like infamous bad guy bank robber. It's pending a rewatch. I remember that movie being awesome. Jimbo, I'm going to, I'm going to make a guess here. I'm, I imagine that that movie is problematic as fuck in 2018. (laughs) Someone please please watch it and we can maybe, you know, (laughs) come back in and re-edit this. But I remember it being awesome and there was probably some punching down really funny parts about Cuban Gooding Jr. being deaf. So take that with a grain of salt. It's, it's been way too long since I watched it. Now, there's there's an episode that I have recently seen. If my name is Earl, uh, Joy is about to go to prison for her third strike. And her lawyer is deaf. And, of course, she is acting just like you would imagine a white trash woman acting with a deaf person. She doesn't realize that she can read lips. She's making fun of her. Eventually, Earl, like, goes out on a date with her. And uh, it's just a great, it's a great story, a great, a great one-shot episode. Yeah, shout out Marley Matlin being deaf representation on television for... Is that her? A while, yeah. She was on West Wing, and she was also in Picket Fences. She's great. My name is Earl, episode The Trial. Yep. So now we are into part four, or as Jimbo calls it, the fun part, where Jimbo makes fun of me, he cheats, he uh, just stacks the deck against old Drew, because it amuses him to see me in pain and unhappy. And this is Petard Trivia. Uh, Honest John, we're still waiting for that bling to come in the mail. 
you know, you can send it to either Jimbo or I. Uh, we'll get it to Jacob Williams, and he will pay for postage and handling to get it back to me when I inevitably retake the crown and then retire on top. Or if I can work my way up the charts, you know. You lost to Mo. Yeah, so, I'm at the bottom of the barrel you right know, now. At this, point, at this point, all of us have one victory somewhere, except for Jimbo. Yes. Hoisters, as usual, I will be the judge and the jury, and I will determine all points during this competition. And hopefully you've eaten some snacks. Now, there will be five questions. My goal is that each question will be awarding a point to one of the hoisters. There is a multiple choice question in tonight's. There are a couple uh, closest answers. And the final answer is going to include an argument. So, let's go ahead and get started. But before that, yep, Drew's buzzard is going to go like this. Buzz. And Moe's buzzard is going to go like this. Ping. Question number one. Okay, this, this, is, this has a potential bonus point involved. The very first text that Danny sends Kate, how many emojis are in the text? And for a bonus point, what emoji or emojis are they? Buzz. Drew. Five emojis. Airplane, happy face, thumbs up, ring. That is a decent answer. It is not the correct answer. Mo, would you like to come in for a steal? If you want to be a dick, Drew's answer is, is five, so you could go above or below that. I would go with four or six if I, if I was you. Okay. I, I, Why is this price is right? She's right or wrong. One dollar, Bob. It's a two-part two question. I feel like I don't remember there being that many. I'm going to say four. I'm going to say four. I'm sticking with it. Okay. And I'll say uh, diamond ring and then like the like this one when you like shrug your shoulders. <laughs> okay. A shrug, okay. Any other ones, Mo? And then like a smiley face, kissy face. Mo got one point. It was four. The four are a banana, a dude with a cowboy hat smiling, what? fingers crossed, okay? The, the first two fingers crossed, uh -oh. and then a huh. cow. Yeah, so I'm not going to give Drew any points, but Drew, way to good on you for going out there, answering first, and giving Mo the you chance seems very for confident, the steal. Drew. Yes. Five I was a like great I answer. It. Maybe it was the second time he texted. Yeah, it could have been. So we're moving on to question number two. His emoji game is shitty. <laughs> Banana Question peel? number two, Mo has a one-point lead. Wow. This will be the best answer. If a deaf viewer was watching this show, what would have been the first thing they saw in the pilot episode? They saw? What's the first thing a deaf person's going to see in the pilot episode? Buzz. Drew. Uh, ears? Because didn't they show um, Kate's ear with her hearing aid in it? Decent answer. That is not the correct answer. It might be the best answer, depending on what Mo has. Mo, would you like to come in for a steal? Yeah, closest answer, Mo. Put a dollar out there. Uh, <laughs> fuck. Well, an airplane? Mo's going to steal that point. The, the first thing <laughs> that a deaf viewer would have saw... It looks like an art table. There's like a, it looks like a piece, like an art or like a, a panel of some sort. There's a couple of rulers and a chair. The second scene goes to a can full of paint. The third scene goes to him smoking. He does pick up that airplane before we ever see Kate's ear. Uh, so Mo's okay. going to get that point. We have a 2 Dang, nothing Mo. lead by Mo. Going in. But I don't get what that has to do with if a deaf person was watching. Is it because there was. There's no, there's no sound. So, so they're relying on their sight. I know, but a person who's not deaf would also, that would have been, yeah, like, that's the first true. thing they saw would also have been the same thing a deaf person saw. Right, Definitely. Like, so I guess I guess there wasn't really any reason for me to specify that besides just to throw you guys off. <laughs> Whatever, man. All right, question number three. It's right before Michael's book signing, the book nerd is very impressed with Michael. Why is the book nerd so impressed and infatuated with Michael Rosen? Buzz. True. Uh, he wrote a gay protagonist. And they need more gay protagonists in the world. In graphic novels. More gay protagonists in graphic novels. That is exactly it. Drew got that point. So Go, Drew. Drew is stepping stepping his stepping himself back in. We are going into question number four. Mo has a two one lead. Desperation. All right, this will be our multiple choice question, Mo. Desperate. Okay. All right. If you do know the answer, you can buzz in and, and I will give <laughs> you the point without telling me the right choice if you have the right answer. So multiple choice. What was the title of Michael's new graphic novel that they are publicizing in Seattle? Fuck. A, Jump. B, 
struggle, C, spice, D, skip. Damn it, Buzz. Drew. Skip. That is that is correct. It is skip. Yeah. All right. I was like, is it slip? Is it slip? Why is it called slip? Oh, slip would have been a good one. Actually, I should have had slip in there. But anyways, question number five. We were at a 2-2 tie. Mo, Mo really jumped out in front, and Drew has climbed his way back. Is, you'll have 20 seconds to respond. Uh, you, you can't choose the same answer as the other person. A little bit of context. Kate tells two proposal stories in the pilot. She says one was the best, and she says one was the worst. Question, was Kate's proposal the best or the worst proposal? Dude, Ping. Mo. Well, you want us to tell you what the best and the worst stories were? No, he wants you to say whether you thought the proposal was the best or the worst. Yeah, does she think it's the best or does she think it's the worst? You have 20 seconds. What I think Kate really means? Yes. I think Kate really thought it was the worst. And I think that because the story she eventually told Michael was was that it was the worst because he blindfolded her and she was scared. And then she chugged the champagne because she was dry mouth from all the fight or flight reflexes <laughs> inside of her. Um, and then he was freaking out that she drank it. And then she didn't even know what he was talking about. Buzz. Arger. I think it's the best <laughs> because I think she just told him in the jail cell what he needed to hear because he doesn't like her fiance. She's in love. And, you know, yes, those shitty things happened, but <laughs> she's only telling him that in the jail cell so that he'll feel better about, you know, getting arrested on a plane. And so she loves him. Didn't you guys see that big old hug at the end of the episode? She said yes. Rebuttal? Because if she really, if she knew he didn't like him, then she wouldn't have given him more fuel to fan, to like All right, fire. No, I'm sorry. There, there are no rebuttals in okay. this argument. <laughs> You let her talk a while before you said there were no rebuttals. <laughs> well, so I was curious if he was going to say something interesting or not. I, I'm not. Now, Drew, I have to commend you, sir. That was a very excellent defense of the wrong answer. Moe's going home with this victory. Three, two, one. Ah. Is this the first time I've won? I think this is. You beat no, Jimbo. you beat me. Oh, yeah, Moe is on a hot streak, dude. <laughs> Moe has a two nothing win. Mo, you win one more, and I think you're going to be ready to take on Jake Williams. Oh, shit. I'm nervous. It's a good ending to the episode. That was exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Mo's making a comeback, man. <laughs> hey, I'm the underdog here. <laughs> Not anymore. You're number Not... one contender, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now Mo's the number one contender. Maybe, maybe Zan will come out of retirement. Oh, maybe. We'll you better hope not, Mo. Uh -oh. <laughs> Hoisters, if you can't tell by the plugs we're about to announce, the show is officially over. But if you love us as much as we love us, we are going to stick around for a few more minutes. And next week, we are going to be tackling Handmaid's Tale. Well, I was going to mention if we can move it back one week. Oh, my gosh. Because you're going to kill me. Yeah, dude. But I have dude. to be honest, because I'm not a good liar. I forgot the microphone again. Shit, most. You have two mics in Seattle now? No, 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 no. I just left the one I originally left. You should have two mics, man. I can have two now. I'll have two after september okay but why do you have zero now <laughs> i have one well then why do you need it why do you need one? the other oh, one because isn't my cousin gonna host with us and i can give her her mic and then she can use this box situation and and record oh, okay. her track does she want to join us for another show maybe marvelous miss mazel just because i've been switching the schedule like every week man it's kind of shrek breath is upset is oh yeah and i have i have what? another viewer that's like Wonder, wants to know why The Handmaid's Tale has been bumped twice now. She's like had it in her calendar and everything. <laughs> really? AJ, yeah. Really? AJ's waiting for, for, for uh, The Handmaid's Tale, man. Okay, that's fine because I know my cousin mentioned she would feel kind of biased to do Handmaid's Tale because she and I both have watched the whole thing, so it would be hard for us to talk about just the pilot. <laughs> oh, wow. We don't need two more mo spoilers in this one. So let's, so let's bring on your cousin fine. for... Uh, for another show maybe Fine. the week after that and i'm sorry i forgot the mic again that's okay i thought you forgot both of them there no i was about to say what the hell are you recording on right now mail <laughs> most suck her entire computer yeah. in a styrofoam box <laughs> <laughs> okay so this is some good shop talk so hoisters next week we are doing handmaid's tale for you aj 
Part one and needs to be quick and short because it's going to kill sure. me. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay. And then also I would like to plug Jake Drew for our official opening and closing music. You can contact him. He can mix and make you some music. And you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or our Facebook group. All those links you can find in the show notes. Uh, we are featured on the But Why Though podcast.com as one of their podcast network. I also write a movie review there once in a while. I swear to God, it'll come up soon. And also, hey guys, we wanna we wanna up our numbers this month. So if you are listening to this point, talk to someone else, you know, and say, hey, I have a podcast that I like. It's an indie podcast, so promote it. Like fuck cereal. Everyone has listened to cereal. Okay, <laughs> like get those indie pods out there, or go listen to another one of our episodes. We're good. And then, and then we did have a, a petard first. We have an extended conversation. If you're at all interested, I, I got a little bombarded with the Antoine Dotson, and I wasn't prepared to discuss that. So I took it to the boards. I added a discussion. You got all the data, or sorry, you got all the, the media you need to be involved in that conversation. And I, I ended with some questions that I'd be curious your opinions on. So go check that out. Mo, you missed out on like a long text chain conversation about white feminism, and so we did not get to. And we didn't even talk about that feelings. much. <laughs> we didn't. Well, we had a lot of long text messages about we it. We did. We kind of hashed out most of the issues before we started discussing it on on the show, I guess. Okay, so now we're in some shop talk. That was a good episode. We ran a little bit long, but you know, we had some good conversation. We did. I have one one more thing to add. Hoisters, if you were listening last week to Kimmy Schmidt, we have the opportunity to maybe reassign that, that very forgettable crab man that somehow walked home with a crab man that nobody remembers with the much deserving crab man from the media that I've just been referencing. I've seen it. Who'd you give the crab man to? There's a skeezy dude at a club who kind of really delineated that how nobody naive remembers. Kimmy was. I did talk about the problematic nature of auto-tuning um, a black person from local news and how that seems exploitive. So I did not co-sign that crab man. No, he did not. Right. So my ar- argument that's on the website, if anyone, if anyone would like to see it in a little more detail, is that the Kimmy Schmidt theme song is not making fun of Antoine Dodson. It's more retelling the narratives behind these like really tragic kidnapping incidents and and that that opening scene is kind of just paying tribute to the way that people the people depict these stories the way that local news finds like the most ignorant black person they can find and then exploits them by trying to go viral and putting weird shit on the news Kim, Kimmy Schmidt's theme song there's actually an extended interview by Walter Bankston, and I think it's hilarious. So go check it out, and you can weigh in whether it's hilarious or despicable. Like, and you can, you know, you, you can side with me or Drew on this one. Where are you at, Mo? I was definitely younger when that came out. The what's Anton was that a while ago? Hide your wife, I missed hide it. Your it was, was two thousand ten. Yeah, I I just watched it for the first time last week. Okay, yeah, I was like just out of undergrad, but I was still a little bit problematic and what i laughed at so i yeah, laughed you probably at that thought when it was i first heard right? about it yeah um just like i laughed about there was a lot of other similar type of youtube phenomenons of of black people being funny during times of crisis or i mean one was about the leprechaun did you see that one yes and the, am- the amateur sketch yeah um but i get that it's not something to be laughed at so i can see where you're coming from through where we should be more sensitive but tina fey I think you said somewhere in what you wrote, like she like doesn't give a shit what people think. I don't think that's necessarily true, but there was there was a bunch of things I sent. But what we talked about last week was how she claimed she wasn't gonna explain jokes anymore, but then she ended up explaining one. So oh, I see. <laughs> so yeah, guys, get out there, go look at that. This is done. It's good shop talk. And Shrek Beth, you know? weigh in, man. You know, don't be afraid to jump on the boards, brother. I like how um I've I've been messing around with the WordPress stats and it shows us like who has commented the most on all of the boards and I'm like, Yep, I know those three people. Yeah. They're great. Shrek Breath is one up. of them? No. No, no uh it's it's zero, it's Fitz, it's Jimbo, and it's Honest Wait, John. Back? 
No, no he just back, has a really but... strong posting history. <laughs> oh man, zero. Zero should come, come back. back. Come on back, zero. I'm sorry. He was gonna come back, but Mo, you iced him out, man. I didn't mean to. <laughs> you set me up. You like soft pitched it, and I just hit it out of the park. Yeah. You yeah. set me up for Maybe that, I, zero. If you're listening, I might have. I'm sorry. Zero's definitely listening. Okay, well, Good. we. I would love to have you up on the boards again because we just we need we need your opinions and your insights to really spark conversation. Jimbo has talked about uh, zero coming on and like hosting a Petard's trivia segment. <laughs> that would be fun. It would be amazing. Zero, you know, we want you back. Resurrected as Jimmy Christ or not, whatever it takes, man. <laughs> the, sh- the shop talk got emotional. That's fine. It got heated. I think I think zero, you can handle a little bit of confrontation right yeah for sure for yeah sure. don't shy away don't shy away you're better than that <laughs> zero's amazing I'm, I'm looking at a gift that zero sent me in the mail it's it's above my comp- oh that's awesome <laughs> so drew is holding you know drew you should maybe take take a picture of that we can toss that toss that up somewhere oh that's cyclops oh <laughs> that's awesome zero where's my gift <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't have said those harsh things. Shit. Bro. Be I careful. I really just got on zero's no, shit list, I mean, didn't I? I mean, no. I mean, the gifts come in like floods, man. You be <laughs> careful what you're what you're opening up here. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, so zero. So Mo wants you back. She also wants a gift. Make some make some requests. Do you want Betty Boop? I mean, I mean, what are you looking for, Mo? Because <laughs> there's zero has a ginormous toy collection. I know. Um, surprise it's going to probably be a toy. I okay. would love to know what what your vision is of me as a toy. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I'm good. Yeah. But so uh, every day I'm hoistling Drew out. Every day we hoistling Jimbo out. Every day I'm hoistling Mo out. <laughs>